Okay, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be back here. It's a wonderful place. And um, so as you saw in Stuart's talk, we can now read and write, possibly on a scale of 10 picoseconds or so. So I will show you uh, a path that might lead ultimately to even faster switching times. Um, this field was initiated, as many of you know, um, <clears throat> by this experimental paper uh, that showed that um, <clears throat> demagnetization induced by a short laser pulse can be achieved on a scale of something like a picosecond. Now we know it can be made even faster, uh, less than 100 femtoseconds. And there's, uh, many suggestions what the mechanism of this demagnetization is in the literature, like direct interaction of spins with the magnetic component of the laser, spin flip electron phonon scattering, super diffusive spin transport. Um, um, while I would say all these mechanisms exist in nature, there's no question, at very short time scales, actually none of those is active. Um, it's an even faster mechanism uh, that I will show you. It's a laser-induced charge excitation followed by spin-orbit-driven demagnetization of the not initially excited electrons. So what this exact, exactly means, you will see in a minute. <coughs> so the approach that we use is an ab initio approach, time-dependent density functional theory. This was developed some time ago. It's based on a hohenberg cohn type theorem that shows that the density, the time-dependent density in a driven system and the time-dependent potential are uh, in a rigorous one-to-one -one correspondence, which implies that, at least in principle, every quantum mechanical observable can be calculated from the density alone. Now, the density can be calculated in practice from a system of auxiliary, non-interacting particles, so you propagate in time a single particle Schrödinger equation and the density is obtained from these orbitals and the effective potential that appears in this Schrödinger equation contains a Hartree part and an exchange correlation part which is a functional of the density. So this approach is completely parameter free, so no parameters on the system that you want to calculate enter except for the charges and the position, positions of the nuclei. And it's an approach that is in principle exact in the sense that although this looks like a mean field equation, the density that you get from these equations is the true one, is the one that you would get from a fully correlated wave function, provided you use here the right exchange correlation potential as a functional of the density. So what we uh, use then in practice for the spin-dependent calculation is a generalization to non-collinear situations including spin-orbit coupling. This is the equation. So here you see a purely time-dependent vector potential that describes the, ve the laser field, <coughs> the cone champ potential, scalar potential that we had before. And then a Zeeman term that involves an external magnetic field, if there is one, and the exchange forces, and there's a time-dependent spin-orbit coupling term. So this is the, the gradient of the cone champ potential that appears here, and the momentum operator. So this is a time-dependent spin-orbit coupling term. Now this is fully non-collinear. These, um, uh, these single particle orbitals are Pauli spinners. And an important aspect of this whole approach uh, uh, that I'd like to emphasize here is that these functionals of the density and the spin magnetization are universal. So there's one and only one functional that you have to find that is valid for all Coulomb systems, for all atoms, molecules, and solids. Right? One functional. So only if you succeed to find a good functional, you're done also tells you that this is not so easy, right, if you want to, with one functional, describe all systems in the world. 
Okay, so what then an output of that theory is, is uh, the vector field of spin magnetization. So, uh, indicated here for a chromium monolayer. Um, the way I'm going to plot this throughout my talk is um, with little arrows here. This is the white little things that indicate the direction of the spin. And the absolute value of the magnetization uh, is indicated by the colors uh, here. So these, these little arrows here are not a, a, a spin or something. Like, so th this is a much higher resolution than what, what you have in, in Heisenberg type models or so where you talk about an atomic spin. This is a vector field that even allows for intra-atomic non-collinearity. Right? And you see this for the absolute value here, right? You have within an atom different values of the magnetization. And what you see here is the typical 120 degree uh, frustrated uh, spin uh, arrangement. So this shows in this direction, this direction, this direction here. Okay, so now uh, this was introduction. Here's now the first result for a calculation. Uh, iron, cobalt, nickel, bulk. This is the laser field, so very short laser pulse, six femtoseconds. And what you see is indeed the magnetization here normalized to the initial magnetization decreases as a function of time. Most of the decrease, as you see, happens actually after the laser pulse is over. Right, so this is the end of the pulse. And here you see the effect is strongest for nickel than weakest for iron in this case. One aspect of the numerical calculation, so in all calculations that we did, the wavelength of the laser is in the visible regime, which means that the wavelength is very large compared to the size of the unit cell. And therefore, we can describe the laser field as constant in space, right, which means that we can use a purely time-dependent vector potential. So this is what appeared in the equations. So we make dipole approximation. Then this has a crucial advantage, namely the fact that the laser is described by a purely time-dependent function. The periodicity of the Hamiltonian is preserved, and this means we can implement that in standard uh, band structure codes. We can use Bloch theorem, etc. And what we use is the ELK code. ELK stands for electrons in K-space. Those are the two developers, K. Dewhurst and Sangeeta Sharma. Some people say that the actual name is electrons in K's space. K is that guy. And these people succeeded in making this code time dependent. So what we do is real time propagation of these um, um, time dependent orbitals. So the result here, which we're now going to an analyze, is the moment decreases, and this is on a very fast time scale. 16 femtoseconds or so. And, well, this would be an enormous speed up if we could make this useful in, in a device. So now let's analyze these results a little bit. What is the mechanism of this, of this extremely fast decrease? Well, the nice thing in these uh, uh, ab initio calculations is that you can switch off terms. So we switched off spin-orbit coupling, and this is the result. This is the Z component, XY component for nickel. And you see, as a function of time, that you see nothing. So the magnetic moment does not change. So this demonstrates, without spin-orbit coupling, there's no change in the moment. And one can even see this mathematically directly from the equation of motion. It's an exact equation of motion that follows from the time-dependent cone jam equations. Um, this is it. You get a term that is a spin torque, the global torque exerted by the uh, effective magnetic field. If there's no external field, this is the exchange correlation field. And this term, as you integrate over the whole system, is zero. 
That's due to the fact that the exchange forces cannot exert a global torque on the system. They can change locally, but not, uh, they cannot be responsible for a global torque, so that term is zero. And this, clearly, you see from the 1 over c squared, uh, comes from spin-orbit coupling, so if we neglect that term, then the right-hand side is zero, and there's no spin dynamics. So spin-orbit coupling drives the magnetization. And this is now maybe the most important um, analysis. We have decomposed here the magnetization into a contribution that is called excited and remaining. Um, excited is the electrons uh, whose magnetization is found in the interstitial region. So this, roughly speaking, comes from exciting to higher levels that are more delocalized. And those are uh, the black curves, the remaining electrons. So as you excite, initially, that's uh, an optical excitation, the electrons just take their spin with themselves, so the magnetization um, <coughs> goes up in the interstitial region, and by the same amount, total magnetization almost constant, over these first five femtoseconds, um, the uh, magnetization of the remaining electrons goes down. But then what you see is that the total demagnetization curve essentially follows the demagnetization of these remaining more localized electrons. While the excited ones in the interstitial region basically stays constant. And so this means that, and if you think about it, it's perfectly plausible, knowing that it's spin orbit coupling that drives the mechanism, you see that it's been orbit coupling since it involves the gradient of the potential. It is much larger near the nuclei for the localized orbitals than for the highly excited electrons. So spin orbit coupling is active near the nuclei and drives the demagnetization. And this is a universal mechanism that we found. It's, it applies to essentially all systems at these very short time scales. And it's plausible that it's a universal mechanism because it acts near, uh, 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 for the localized electrons near the nuclei. And it's found also um, by the group of Stefano Sanvito and Maria Kemena, Kemenova, who is here with us, for uh, clusters, right? Perfectly plausible because it's a mechanism that acts on the localized electrons. Whether this whole thing is a periodic solid or ends somewhere, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is what I said before. You have an initial optical excitation and then spin orbit coupling drives the more local uh, 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 electrons. Now, here's now um, the chromium monolayer again, and I'm going to show you now a movie. So here's the electric field of the laser. What you see here is a wild motion of, of the spins. The main message here is the change in color. Right? Remember, the, the color scale was the absolute value of the magnetization. And this went from the red to the bluish, uh, greenish uh, uh, color here. So the, again, the magnetization at the atom, near the atom, decreases. So again, this universal mechanism also found here for this frustrated spin arrangement. Here's a nickel slab, five monolayers, and um, here we see as we compare the decrease for bulk with the slab calculation that the effect is larger. Um, this is for an experimental pulse, um, and as you compare with the experiment, you see this is now a longer calculation on, uh, for 200 femtoseconds. On these very short time scales, like 50, 75 femtoseconds or so, agreement of our calculation with experiment is perfect. For larger time, sc time scales, then experiment decreases further. And um, this is perfectly plausible because on the, on the longer time scales, the other mechanisms that I mentioned in the beginning electron phonon scattering, diffusion, and so on, these other mechanisms then become relevant. <coughs> so here's a, 
another calculation that's an interface, uh, three monolayers of nickel, five monolayers of aluminium. And um, here then um, you observe a spin current from laser induced from nickel to aluminium. But also here uh, you see that um, if you compare um, a calculation without and with spin orbit coupling, that both the transport of, so the spin current from nickel to aluminium and spin orbit coupling on these short time scales is important. So now completely different uh, thing, I will show you that these uh, uh, demagnetization processes which are driven by spin orbit coupling and which happen on a time scale of something like 50 femtoseconds, that on an even shorter time scale they are not relevant. I will show you for some Häusler compounds that we can have a spin transfer between sublattices on an even faster time scale of the order of 5 femtoseconds. So here first example, nickel to manganese gallium. Here's the moment, so this is uh, still a ferromagnet. Nickel and manganese have the main moment here. Here's first uh, a calculation, this is now in atomic units. Um, a demagnetization process as we saw it before. This is a short uh, laser pulse, 5 femtoseconds again demagnetization. But now as we look at the magnetization of uh, the sublattices, we see that on a much faster time scale, right, this is 100 atomic units, so that's about 2.5 femtoseconds, we have here a decrease of the moment uh, on the magnesium sublattice and an increase of nickel. And this is perfectly well understood if you look at the, the <coughs> at the initial density of states. So we have a transfer from manganese to nickel. These are the manganese uh, orbitals. Those are the nickel contributions to the density of states in the downspin channels. And what you see here is then that the orbitals Above the Fermi energy, just above, are of nickel character. Uh, just below are dominantly of manganese character. So you simply have an optical transition from here to there. The spin is conserved on this scale. While for the upspin, there's no available states. So what you see is that there's some transfer to higher levels this is what we call the delocalized contribution. So what you see here is, is that just looking at the initial density of states, you can very nicely predict what happens. So this is a generic feature that we found for a set of uh, 25 Häusler compounds, that whenever you have the states, the empty states just above the Fermi energy are of nature um, of one sublattice, while the states, the occupied states, just below the Fermi uh, surface are different sublattice, then you find this optical transfer from one sublattice to the other. Here's another example, nickel manganese uh, uh, antimonide. So here you have decrease of manganese, increase of nickel. Um, what is plotted here is the number of electrons um, as uh, for spin down and spin up. Here manganese goes up, nickel goes down, the delocalized stay more or less constant, while for up spin um, manganese goes down, delocalized increase. So here you have a transition to these more highly excited states. Again, it's perfectly understood. We have the same situation as in the previous system. Here is um, one sublattice, here's the other sublattice, you have a transfer um, uh, from one sublattice to the other. And uh, here there's no states available, you excite to these more delocalized orbitals. Right? And uh, this can be summarized nicely in a cartoon. 
if this is the, the ground state orbitals of nickel, this is uh, the ones of manganese, and these represent these, these more highly excited uh, states, then you have an increase, uh, a, a, an optical transfer here from that to that in the downspin channel, and then in the upspin channel, this excitement to uh, the more delocalized states, and this whole thing um, is then reflected in the change of number of electrons on the sublattices. Okay, now here comes a different case. Here, if you look at the density of states, you have on both sides of the Fermi surface um, cobalt states, so the same sublattice. In such case, we always find that there's no transfer to the other sublattice. The optical excitation happens within the same lattice. And this is kind of plausible because these orbitals are more nearby, so there's more overlap, so roughly speaking the oscillator strength for this will be larger. So now finally an antiferromagnetically ordered system, manganese 3 gallium. So here we have these two different uh, antiferromagnetically ordered manganese sublattices. <coughs> what we see here is a transfer from the sublattice 2 to sublattice 1 and the magnetization of both decreases again on a scale of something like 3 femtoseconds. So here the density of states is again of that character that one sublattice uh, is below the Fermi surface, the other sublattice is above. And the same here for the other spin channel. So you have transfer from manganese 1 sublattice to ma manganese 2 sublattice, and here the other way around. And this leads to a decrease of moment on each sublattice. Now here's how these things change with the intensity of the laser. As one might expect, the effect is largest and fastest, uh, the stronger the laser field. And here's a summary. So, the first part of the talk focused on this demagnetization process that happens on a scale of 50 femtoseconds um, and is driven by spin orbit coupling. And um, this spin orbit coupling is also important uh, even at, uh, at uh, spin current across. Um, uh, an interface, and finally, this by one order of magnitude faster optical process uh, that leads to transfer, uh, transfer of spin moment between sublattices in uh, Heusler compounds. So, before I stop, I want to thank the people who have done all the calculations. Sangeeta Sharma and Kate Dewhurst have uh, developed this code, most of these calculations. Um, were done by Peter Elliott, uh, a postdoc and a PhD student, Kevin Krieger. And uh, Florian worked on aspects that I have not mentioned here, namely the approximate exchange functionals that we use in the calculation. So there it's important that they uh, have a, a local uh, uh, spin talk, and this can be achieved by generalizations of, of uh, the, the functionals, GGA type functionals that we have. Now, what is still missing here in the calculations, this is a whole list of things that we are now doing. Um, <coughs> so, one may ask, what about decoherence? Right? We have an extended system. Um, so, this is in principle contained in uh, time dependent density functional theory. However, um, what one needs to describe this is better functionals, namely those that have a memory so that the exchange potential at time t depends on the densities at previous times. So with, with this kind of functionals one is able to describe the coherence. Then other relaxation processes due to electron phonon scattering uh, need to be included. So all this 
is important to describe somewhat longer timescales than we have looked at so far. Then uh, relaxation due to radiative effects, so simultaneous propagation of the Maxwell equations. Then, and uh, this is uh, an effort towards the ab initio description of the motion of domain walls. As you know, uh, the formation of a domain wall is uh, due to a competition of exchange forces and uh, the dipole-dipole interaction. Right? On long range, it's the dipole-dipole interaction. So this quantum electrodynamics effects uh, that are important here. And um, it's this balance between exchange and dipole-dipole interaction that leads to the formation of the domain wall in the first place. And if you want to describe a domain wall and its motion in time, you need this. And so we need, first of all, a density functionalization of the dipole-dipole interaction. You need functionals to propagate because you cannot propagate the fully interacting system. And this is uh, one of our projects. And finally, um, <coughs> we use optimal control theory, so we shape the lasers, uh, the laser pulses in a way such as to, for example, make the demagnetization time even faster, um, or ideally to be able also to remagnetize, right? We want to switch ultimately. And finally, and we have made some progress along these lines, we can also create skirmions with uh, suitably shaped laser pulses. That's a different topic for next year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, the talk is open for question. Is the spin orbit coupling, spin orbit coupling in the ground state, and the spin orbit coupling of the system after we pump? Well, we start with an initial ground state, uh, and there's also spin orbit coupling. But then, what drives uh, uh, the demagnetization is a time-dependent spin orbit coupling. So this, this term that I showed in the beginning, sigma dot gradient of the time-dependent exchange correlation potential cross uh, uh, momentum. But does this time dependent spin orbit coupling determine both the demagnetization time and the amplitude of the demagnetization? Yes. Okay. Yes. Very last thing you mentioned here that one of the future perspectives is going towards description of switching. Uh, so far, all the experimental demonstration of all optical switching occurred in multi sublattic system. Do you think that it's possible also to switch something like a ferromagnet? So just one sublattice? Something we haven't really done. Maybe, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question about the switch plans. So you mentioned the good in the whole interaction, but uh, uh, also what we heard from the sewer stuff that the curvature has to replace for the normal um, formation of the well, this is included. So all these interactions that have more this mobile character, like like DM interaction, this ultimately comes from spin orbit coupling. Now, since we use the most general form of spin orbit coupling, this is this is all included. Now, if we did a calculation for that particular geometry, right, where you have this this curved wire, then yes, this, this should give the same result, yes. Yeah, well it's, a, uh, well, it's a big system that one would have to deal with, and that's exactly what I mentioned here, right? We want to describe, in an ab initio way, as real-time propagation, the motion of a domain wall, right? This is, this is one of our projects. Uh, for this, we first need the dipole-dipole interaction to be included, right? But then, yes. So, all all the effects that, uh, in, a, in an intuitive uh, way, and and in model Hamiltonians, are taken care of. This is included here. Yeah. Good question. 
this is a summary that the in current major cases are being important. I just try to get the point how they are arising in the direction of the union in this case in terms of where they're coming from. Are they generated by spinnery problem in the major cases or what do you mean by that? Well, there's a, a spin current. So if you look at at the equation of motion, right? So there's m dot, and then there's the first term on the right hand side is this uh, uh, this uh, spin torque term, and and the next term is uh, the divergence of the spin current tensor. So this is like a continuity equation. So as magnetization goes away from one place to the other. As a current. So, um, several things. So, so, so we would claim, well, there's initially this optical excitation, right? So, motion of electrons from one place to another. This is already a current. Then, spin orbit coupling gives you 40% effect here, that's what was the com comparison of with and without spin orbit coupling. But then is also this, probably the onset of the spin diffusion mechanism, right, that the excited electrons have different uh, transport properties from what they had before, and then the, there's a flow of, of spin current. Yeah. Was another question? Wow. I assume in Yes. So this second part, yes, we, we treat the photon field really in the, in the proper way as, as quantized photons. Yes, we are working on that as well. So a first step that we have done already is, is we have Maxwell equations. And um, yes, so that's certainly an interesting uh, uh, thing to pursue. Now the first question is a hard one. So what, what is conserved here? If, if you had just an atom, right, then everything is clear. Right? You would have a transfer of spin moment to the orbital moment. But here in a solid, not so clear what the word angular momentum refers to. So what, what is conserved? I, I'm sure that there is some kind of transfer of spin moment into some charge motion, some, some kind of orbital current. Yes. Now, as you know, the calculation of uh, an, an, an orbital moment, this requires for a periodic <coughs> solid calculation of the very phase, which is technically in this whole time dependent setup and k point sampling, and so it's technically not so easy. So, we are still working on that. So, the ultimate truth on that question we, we don't have yet, but hopefully next year. It's not so easy. <laughs> Yes. And if you take these surface terms, I guess you need, uh, uh, otherwise your, your sample can watch it from the sample order. Exactly. And, uh, so I assume a kind of thing uh, that you say we exert in our calculation to prove it for, which we uh, do in constraint calculation in some sense because we keep our sample fixed. It's something related to that. Well, ultimately, what probably happens in the real world is a, tr 
transfer, as you equilibrate, right, a transfer of magnetic moment to the lattice. Sure. So this then works mm -hmm. with this electron phonon scattering. And this, um, if you have a fine enough measuring instrument, really would lead to a rotation of the sample. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now here, uh, in, in our calculations, <coughs> uh, nuclei are fixed. <coughs> and moreover, uh, the, the system is, is considered as a periodic system, so that necessitates of calculating the magnetic moment from a very phase, which is <coughs> not the principal problem, but in this time dependent setup, plus K point sampling, it's technically not so easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's time only for a very short last question. Um, orbital moments on spin orbit coupling depend on the dimensionality of the system. So 3D to D point D, you create the spin orbit coupling. Yes. Uh, here you showed a 2D system now. Mm -hmm. So if you try to think that in a 3D system you're going to be smaller and the atomic chain the effect will be enhanced. Yes, exactly. So this is what I, I showed you in this one calculation on the nickel slab. There indeed we find that the demagnetization process is faster and stronger in the slab compared to the uh, 3D solid. So that's exactly what you say. And chain, we, we didn't do that, but we would expect that to be even faster. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. It's a coffee break.